Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us for the final session. Now, we've explored the six major doctoral career pathways, talked about how to gain experience within your pathway, discussed how you can communicate your academic and professional skills to potential employers, and now, during this final session, we will explore ways that you can advance your career plans. I will now turn it over to our presenter, Dina Bergren. Welcome back, Dina. Hello, everyone, again. And uh, in this final session, we will focus on your future as a doctoral student, graduate, and professional. Our agenda is to explore your evolving career identity and help you develop a career advancement strategy to move closer to your career goals. Finally, we will answer questions and hear from our two remaining panelists who have experience in research and analysis and also in higher education. So let's go ahead and get started. In addition to your education and professional training, think about these three areas to manage your career. Experience, people, and story. This is a model we adapted from the book Working Identity by Erminia Ibarra. As reflected in this model, your career identity evolves through gaining experience, meeting new people, and communicating your career story to others. You will also notice that all three areas of experience, people, and story, or EPS, relate to one another. For instance, when you are gaining experience, you're also meeting new people in your field. And at the same time, your professional connections may be able to lead you to new experiences, thereby helping you communicate your career story or brand through the new skills that you have gained. So how do you begin building your EPS? You want to start with the end in mind. Stephen Covey, author of the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, advised to always begin with the end in mind. As you consider future career opportunities that utilize your doctoral skills, Ask yourself these important questions. What is your goal for your doctoral degree? Is it advancement in your current field, making a career transition into new field, becoming the go-to person in your professional or academic community, making a broader social impact, um, or maybe mentoring and teaching others? In what areas do you shine? Are you a great writer, presenter, researcher, leader, project manager, teacher? In other words, in what areas have you excelled? And what do you enjoy most? What aspects of your academic program and professional work are you most drawn to? Is it interacting with others, finding solutions to complex research questions, or maybe writing papers? What difference do you want to make in your field? Do you want to influence change on a broader scale through policy and advocacy work or become a leading consultant in your area of expertise? Maybe transform organizations through performance improvement. And finally, take time to visualize yourself in your future career. Who will you interact with? What environments do you thrive in? And in what ways can you pursue your passions? Whatever career pathway you decide to pursue, an important part of preparing yourself for future opportunities is being able to quickly communicate how you can add value. This is where your career mantra can come in. A career mantra is a simple, short, and memorable statement that outlines your core values and goals. So take a moment and share your career mantra with me. What is your career mantra related to your pathway? Type into the questions box. And if you need some ideas or inspiration, here are a few examples related to the pathways we discussed. An organizational leadership and development example may be, I empower healthcare employees through servant leadership. I analyze data to make informed data-driven 
decisions may be a mantra for the research and data analysis pathway. Someone interested in policy and advocacy might state, I advocate for global mental health awareness. For higher ed, it could be I develop educational programs that lead to student success. A communications writing and editing example might be, I publish online articles to help readers thrive in a technology-driven world. And finally, a consultant might state, I apply quantitative research skills to help nonprofits make improvements. So let's see what we have in, in the questions box. And we have such a large audience, so I will only read a few. Of submissions, but I am so happy to see that all of you are contributing and thinking about your career mantra. I develop rigorous hands-on opportunities to develop future health professionals. I develop collaborative strategies for the online K through 12 setting. I develop educational programs that lead to student success. I optimize, <laughs> oh, okay, that one, let me see. Uh, I develop health education and promotion programs for communities. I analyze data to make informed data-driven decisions, <laughs> excellent. So one of the mantras that we presented applies to many people. I advocate for marriages and families. I empower individuals with intellectual disabilities develop their sexuality. Okay. I develop training modules to improve employee efficiency and organizational productivity. I develop curriculum that empowers teachers and promotes student learning and achievement. I support an advocate for people with mental health and addictions issues. I mentor employees for leadership success. And there are so many more that are coming in. Thank you so much for contributing your mantra and starting to think about your mantra and what it means to you as a doctoral student and professional. So to sum up, the more you know about yourself, the easier it is to create an effective career advancement plan for your future because it can help you focus on what is most important and prioritize your efforts. And before crafting your plan, you also need to do your research to understand what experience you need, who you must connect with, and what skills and qualifications you need to build along the way. Your career exploration may involve visiting the Career Services website and utilizing our career exploration resources to research trends in your field of interest. It may mean getting involved in professional development activities and also seek out advice and feedback from professionals in your field and members of the Walden community who also may have worked in your future role. And after that, you then are ready to build your EPS. So let's look at a few ideas of how to build your experience first. And some of these ideas were mentioned in the prior sessions in this conference. And our panelists have also shared these ideas. But here are some ways to gain skills and experience in five specific areas. So to cultivate your writing skills, consider con contributing an article to a professional newsletter or starting a blog on a topic of interest or expertise, pursuing freelance work, which may include partnering with small businesses, nonprofits, or consultants and projects, writing an article on LinkedIn and sharing it with your professional network, or even self-publishing a book on Amazon. To apply research skills, 
reach out to nonprofits in your area and offer to help with a research project. If you are employed currently, start a new project that applies your academic research skills or submit research for publication in an academic journal. For public speaking, consider delivering a workshop in your community, submitting a conference proposal, or hosting a webinar on a topic of interest. Build your leadership skills by taking on stretch assignments at work, leading a community project or initiative, or even taking on a leadership role in a nonprofit or professional association. And finally, for technology skills, you might assist an organization or individual with a technology project, take a course to learn new skills, or even earn a certification. And these, of course, are just a few ideas to help you get started. And now on to ways to build connections. Through professional associations, you can attend state and national conferences that was mentioned earlier in today's program and participate in professional development events and also engage in other types of meetings. You can build your connections using social media platforms such as LinkedIn and Twitter and also join online forums and Facebook groups related to your interest areas. Become an active member of the Walden communi community by engaging at academic residencies, participating in online discussions, joining honor societies and other types of student organizations. And if you are a Walden graduate, join the Alumni Association. Students and alumni can also network during Walden's Global Days of Service that are coming up in October. So stay, stay tuned for more information about Global Days of Service. Volunteering is another great way to build connections and consider taking on community projects, serving on nonprofit boards, and pursuing skills-based collaborations to help organizations succeed by working with others. And finally, join special interest groups, such as local meetups, where you can connect with others based on common interests, and Toastmasters groups, where you can practice your presentation skills in a group setting, and also other groups and clubs. So as you build experience and connections, you will naturally grow and evolve in your career. Next, consider how you want to communicate your professional brand and tell your new career story. Reinforce your brand by updating your resume, cover letters, and career portfolio, and practice face-to-face -face and online communication skills for informal networking and for formal interviews. Become a social change agent by building your reputation in your community and supporting Walden's social change mission. Pay it forward by serving as a mentor to others and sharing your knowledge and skills in professional communities, organizations, and in other areas of society. So in the last few slides, we introduced potential activities to help with goal setting. And as you develop your future goals, consider using the SMART acronym. SMART goals are specific, they're measurable, they're attainable, relevant, and time specific. And by writing down your goals using this format, you're more apt to achieve your goals. I will now provide an example of a SMART goal for a PhD in human services student who is interested in the organizational leadership and development and the policy and advocacy pathways. By 2021, I will join the American Public Human Services Association to network with human services policy and operations leaders and serve on one committee to help plan a professional development event. Now, this example of a goal is smart because it is specific and measurable. She has made a goal to join one committee. The goal is also attainable within the time frame. It is also relevant to what she would like to accomplish. And finally, 
it is time specific and includes a deadline of 2021. Next, let's start developing your career advancement plan. This slide includes a helpful career planning template. In addition, a PDF of this template is available in your supplemental materials, which have been provided to you through this program. So if you haven't done so already, download your supplemental materials for this conference. And as you can see, the first column includes several categories we discussed today. The goals column is where you want to include your SMART goals related to those categories. You can break down your goals into sub goals or smaller action steps. In the next column, you can include resources needed to achieve your goals. And these resources could be career sites, people, or tools that would be helpful for you in achieving your goals. And finally, the last column includes your deadlines. Creating a career advancement plan can help you track your career progress no matter where you are in your doctoral journey. So now it is your turn. Take a moment to get started by sharing what goals you will add to your career plan. Use the question box to share your goals. So as you share your goals, I do want to provide an example of a goal for a career advancement plan. By 2020, I will connect with three healthcare consultants in the Walden community using LinkedIn and schedule informational meetings with them over the phone to learn more about becoming an organizational consultant in a healthcare setting. So I'm going to go ahead and see if there are other goals we can share. Annual, present a poster at the APHA annual meeting in November of 2020 in San Francisco. Awesome. In the year 2021, I will publish an article on theory in high school history curriculum. By the end of 2019, I would have submitted two abstracts for publication, adding to the oral presentation abstracted already, accepted, excellent. By 2020, I will attend a professional organization in my field and be a presenter, awesome. I will publish my first article in Rural Hospital in a peer-reviewed journal by March 2020, so very specific SMART goal. I will join one professional organization by 2020. I will visit the Walden Career Services website and try the option optimal resume feature. Excellent. And I would like to encourage all of you to visit the Career Services website and register on Optimal Resume if you haven't done so already. In March 2020, I will officially move from the corporate world. <laughs> okay, so moving away from the corporate world. Excellent. I will write one blog story per month for my LinkedIn forum or website. Okay. Excellent. So sharing stories and self-publishing on LinkedIn. At the end of November, I will join a peer review publication with a, an alum in April of 2020. And I'm going to read one more. I will connect with a professional organization and make some publications by December 2019. Okay, so a, a lot of goals related to publishing, to joining professional association, to making a difference uh, in your field and applying your doctoral skills. By 2020, I will create a career portfolio that highlights projects for my academic program, professional achievements, and community activities, and share my por portfolio with six educational policy experts in the DC area. 
Excellent. Thank you, everyone who contributed their SMART goals for their career advancement plan. I encourage you to continue working on your career advancement plan in upcoming days. And as I mentioned, a link to the plan is also available in your supplemental materials. So make sure after the conference to review the supplemental materials. And there is a lot more that is available in that handout. And with that, I would now like to intru introduce our panelists for the research and data analysis and the higher education pathways. Ms. Megan Bledsoe is currently a student at Walden University in the PhD program for public health focusing on community education. Ms. Bledsoe began her career at PRA Health Sciences as an in-house clinical research associate. While at PRA, she graduated with her master's degree in clinical research administration from Walden. And in 2015, Ms. Bledsoe accepted a position at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City as a research coordinator for the Infectious Diseases Department. She began working on her PhD in 2016 and is currently in the dissertation phase. She serves as the secretary for the Heartland Association for Research Professionals, or HARP, in Kansas City, and offers her educational experiences as a peer mentor to those entering the PhD program at Walden. And with that, I'd like to welcome Ms. Megan Bledsoe. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Hi, Ms. Bledsoe, thank you for joining us here today. To help get, get us started, tell us a little bit about your career path. So when I was graduating with my bachelor's degree um, in biology, I realized that graduation was coming up pretty quickly and I had no related job to what I had just spent four years on. So I um, happened to stumble upon a career fair at my university that um, was where I found the position with PRA Health Sciences. Um, and I, when I did the interview, I knew absolutely nothing about clinical research. I knew nothing about that world, but for whatever reason, they decided to take an amazing chance on me. And for those first two and a half years that I worked there, I learned so very much about just the basic ins and outs of doing clinical research. Um, and while I was there, I was on LinkedIn. I was constantly networking with people. Any activities that we had after work, I was constantly going to so that I could make myself know and make people know who I was. Um, and then um, after about two and a half years, I decided that I didn't want to be behind the desk as much anymore. So I applied for my research coordinator position at Children's Mercy, where um, I now am in charge of running the studies, which includes recruiting patients, enrolling them, um, completing study visits, and basically just all around doing everything that I learned at PRA, but with actual patient facing. Excellent. And what career planning strategies helped you advance in your career? I would say a lot of the career planning strategies that I used um, were primarily just networking every chance that I possibly had. Um, within clinical research, there are a lot of groups that you can join to learn more about your position, to learn more about other types of jobs that are out there to see what's interesting to you. Um, I had also shadowed, and so I knew that I wanted to do something in the medical field. I just wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do when I grew up. And then um, also one of like the really helpful things was utilizing things like LinkedIn and um, really relying on my network and seeing what other people in my same education pathway were doing with their lives. And can you tell us a little bit more about some of the um, studies that you have worked on and the research experience that you've gained and how your doctoral skills have been applied in 
the workplace? Um, yeah, so currently I am working um, in clinical research. We have things called federal studies, which are um, supported um, financially through the government. And we have industry studies, which are supported by private sponsors. Um, and so I do a mixture of both. Um, a lot of my industry studies are vaccine related, trying to get a new vaccine out on the market for kids. Um, and then my federal studies, they are grant related. And so for one of my um, federal studies, I assist on creating and developing the grant that we applied for to help kids um, basically bring more clinical trial opportunities to kids in Kansas. There's not a lot of facilities that really do that. And there's even fewer that target children specifically um, to help bring more medications and things that would help them in the long run. So because of my experience in doing a lot of technical writing and things like that through Walden, um, I was really well suited for working on the grant and thinking and using my research background and thinking of obstacles and barriers that we might encounter while um, carrying out what we promised to do. Excellent. And what advice would you have for other Walden doctoral students who are interested in research and data analysis careers? Honestly, I would just say that networking is probably going to be your best bet, um, especially joining things like I am the secretary for the Heartland Association for Research Professionals, which we call HEART. Um, every year we have an annual conference that anybody can come join and we have speakers talk about what's new in research or talk about new methods and practices and techniques and um, interacting with patients and your coworkers to help you be successful in your research career. Um, but in your area, whatever geographical area you are in, there has to be some sort of research support group that you can join that will give you career ideas, they'll give you insight into what's going on in the field of research. And then also just joining things like Twitter or Facebook groups that, you know, utilize those hashtags for the research that you're interested in. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ms. Bledsoe. You offer great tips for making that transition into research and analysis. And now I would like to introduce our final panelist, Ms. Rachel Della Reyes. Ms. De La Reyes is a third year PhD student in education, specializing in higher education leadership and policy at Walden. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of California, Davis, and a master's degree in higher education from Walden. She has worked for the University of California, Davis for more than 10 years in student affairs. She currently serves as a senior academic advisor for the graduate programs in biological and medical sciences at UC Davis. Ms. De La Reyes is also a doctoral peer mentor for Walden University and an active member of NACADA, the National Academic Advising Association. Welcome to the program, Ms. Hi. De La Reyes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Thank you for joining us here today. And tell us more about yourself and your career path. Yes. So I started working in higher ed right after college. I started in an entry level uh, position at the registrar's office. And then from there, I got a position in the financial aid office as a financial aid advisor. And I stayed in that position for nine years. Uh, those two positions gave me a good understanding of higher education operations and student affairs. And at the time that I was in the financial aid office, I um, started my master's uh, program in higher ed. After I completed my master's, I applied and was hired as in a dean's office. So I was hired as a dean's office academic advisor working with undergraduate students in the College of Letters and Science in the Division of Math and Physical Sciences. Uh, I love this job too because it 
gave me experience in the academic affairs side of the house. Um, six months ago, I did a career shift, and now I started a position as a senior academic advisor for graduate students. So I um, not only advise students now, but I advocate for them by advising the dean and the program leaders as on strategies to help uh, students succeed. Um, another thing that I do is I also help with research. So since a lot of my work in higher ed is student-centered, I wanted to know more about the research behind student success and student development. So uh, pursuing a PhD gave me skills to help with assessment and research to help me better my work. And so it led to opportunities at the university, um, like I, I conduct research with a professor that's relating, that is studying uh, chemistry education, and I'm using some of my qualitative and quantitative skills uh, that I've learned here at Walden to help him conduct his research. Uh, the study that I help him with works, uh, looks at how teachers are using technology to teach chemistry and if technology is fostering group discussion as well as group learning. Uh, the professor like records the students and I listen and translate the transcripts, then code the transcripts based off of the coding we used from the conceptual framework. And I learned how to code those transcripts in my qualitative courses here at Walden. Um, throughout the years, I've also realized that in higher ed, you need a PhD or EDD to be considered or to be promoted. So if I wanted to get a director level position in the future, I would need a doctoral to degree to be competitive. So um, that's why I'm pursuing a PhD now. Someday I would love to be a director of an advising office. I love advising students and now advising faculty but my dream job would be to move into a higher position where I can create and manage those advising programs. Wonderful, and what career planning strategies helped you advance in your career? Uh, goal setting, um, goal setting, joining professional conferences, uh, professional associations, the networking and traveling uh, has definitely been uh, the best strategies to help advance my career. So here at Walden, we, we have, in my program, we had to attend residencies and we were allowed, able to, we were given the opportunity to attend international residencies. So for my second residency, I went to Madrid last year and, and I went to Amsterdam this past summer. And my biggest takeaway from those experiences was that higher education is bigger than the bubble I work and live in, in California, uh, higher ed is worldwide. So this realization helped me think bigger about my career opportunities and networking uh, beyond my state and even the US. Uh, so the academic residency, after the academic residencies, I set two specific goals for myself to advance my career and my scope. And I set the goals of presenting at an international conference and seeking out opportunities to gain international experience. Um, so last year, I attended a few conferences for my own professional development. So I went to Nakata Regional, which is, Nakata is the global community for advising, academic advising. I also joined NASPA, which is the Student Affairs Administrators in Higher Education. And I also went to a couple other UC-related conferences. And through that, those conferences, I got to meet people. I also got to see presentations. And that, um, that experience motivated me to want to present uh, at a conference. And so I actually submitted a uh, proposal last year to present on a chemistry peer mentoring program that I oversee here at UC Davis uh, for undergraduate student, undergraduate, underrepresented undergraduate students. And I, I submitted the proposal for Nakata International. 
and my proposal was accepted. And so I had the opportunity to present at Nakata International in Hasselt, Belgium this past summer. And that was such an amazing experience. I got to meet so many people. I got to meet Dr. Uh, Dr. Troxel, who is the director of Nakata Research Center. And we've been chatting about different ways that I can help with Nakata Review, review reviewing journals, and then talking to more people about possibly applying for Fulbright so that I may have a chance to work or network abroad in the next few years. Congratulations on presenting <laughs> for Nakata International. I think that is a huge achievement. And Dr. or Ms. Delareas, what advice would you have for other Walden students interested in higher education careers? Yes, I, I would say what everybody else has been saying this whole conference is network, network, network. So join professional groups like NASPA and NACADA. It's a great way to meet other people with similar interests. I would, I would take advantage of the student, graduate student rate, or even ask your work if they'd be willing to help pay for the membership fees as part of your professional development. Um, another thing that I would, I would say is mentoring too. So finding mentors to support you, whether it's formal or informal mentoring, find mentors to help support you in various capacities. So mentors to help you with your intellectual knowledge, give you academic feedback, or even mentors just to advocate for you and help you find opportunities. Um, I also have mentors that just are there to emotionally support me through my program and through my career. So I think that's been key. Um, my, my university actually offers a great program that connects um, st uh, connects us with the executive leaders and we were able to uh, shadow the executive leaders and learn about their career paths and how they got there. So if you have something like that at your work, I highly recommend it. And if you don't have any opportunities like that at your work, I would recommend that maybe you create it for yourself or find people that want something like that at your work and create it. I'm actually uh, a chair of a mentoring program at Davis that matches advisors with more seasoned advisors to help them to help support each other through professional development. Ms. De La Reyes, these are great tips. Uh, yeah. Thank you for sharing your experience with mentoring. And mm -hmm. also, we have many members of our audience who are interested in higher education careers. So thank you again for joining us. And yeah. now I'd like to hand it over to Angie to field our remaining questions. Excellent, thank you, Dina. So it's now time for some questions. And just as a reminder, these questions can be for Dina, they can be for Ms. Bledsoe, Ms. De Los Reyes. Um, and uh, let's get started. We have a question for Ms. Bledsoe. Um, as a research coordinator, are you actively involved in data analysis, or is your position more coordinating administrative, or is it a little of both? It really depends on the study that I'm doing. Um, when I do the investigator-initiated studies, which are an investigator maybe writes for a small grant within the hospital or something like that, then I have helped with the um, data analysis part of it. And a lot of that has been, um, in my experience, actually qualitative because they have been interviews and discussions like that. Um, when it is industry-sponsored, it's very, I'm just collecting the data and enrolling the patients. And with the federal, I do a little bit of both. Excellent, thank you. Now we have a question from Ms. De Los Reyes. Um, would you recommend taking a non-teaching position at a university as a way to get your foot in the door if you ultimately want to be an instructor? Yes. Um, I, I would like, so right now as a staff or administrator, there are opportunities that I have to teach. So I also 
like teach first year seminars, which are open to staff. And so that gives you experience um, in the teaching environment and to show that you have the ability to instruct students. So I would say yes, it to get your foot in the door and also just to make those connections with faculty. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I have a question for you, Dina. So one of our attendees, uh, Hadiza, is pursuing her degree, but she has been a homemaker for the past few years. Do you have any tips to help her get back into the workplace? Excellent, thank you, Angie. Well, first of all, gaining recent experience is, is really key. So getting out there, and many of our panelists have shared this uh, feedback along with Katie Pieper, who led the Gain Experience session today, but finding a nonprofit organization, um, finding a, a organization in the community and getting involved and, and volunteering and really using doctoral skills, writing skills, research skills. So as Denise mentioned earlier, skills-based volunteering. So there are many organizations out there and they need help and just contacting them and, and trying to meet with some of their leaders and seeing what they need help with. Maybe they need some help with research or data analysis. Maybe they need um, some help providing and giving a presentation to their employees. Also, another thing that you could be doing, of course, is joining a professional association. And when attending professional events, network with people and share her introduction or career mantra or her interest or ways that she can add value. And try to find individuals who might need some help. And they can be maybe independent consultants or uh, maybe they are working in a workplace that and maybe working on a project, or maybe they are volunteering themselves or planning a conference presentation and finding ways that she can help them with projects and be of value to them. So through that, these types of strategies, she would be able to gain skills gain experience and gain connections to be able to reinterpret her story, to be able to update her resume, her cover letter, and create a maybe a career portfolio of projects she worked on. And also gain references, because if she has been out of the workplace, she might need recent references. So that's another way to become more marketable and be able to re-enter the workplace. And of course, contact Career Services because we are here to assist and we have a great website with information to help her market her skills. Thank you, Dina. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a question that is directed at both of our presenters um, from Natalie. And she says, each of the speakers have continued to state that we should get involved in groups and leadership organizations, but the faculty really emphasize that we need to spend most of our time on our dissertations. When is the right time to start joining organizations versus pulling away to prioritize writing your dissertation? Um, uh, Rachel, do you wanna go first? Yes, um, I would say it, like, so I just started recently joining uh, professional associations and I'm in my dissertation writing as well and it's just being able to manage expectations as well as manage time and so you know I, I, I could be one of those that often says yes to too many things but it's just being able to manage like your priorities so yes dissertation writing is important but also making the connections as well as possibly making those connections to get your dissertation published or given the opportunity to propose on your dissertation are priorities for me. So 
I make time to do those within those professional associations. Excellent. Do you have any input, Megan? Yeah, um, I would say like getting involved with a network does not necessarily mean that you're going to hold office. Um, like for me, I attended the HARP conferences for about two or three years before I finally decided like that I wanted to run for it and act as a secretary. Um, and when I did join to act as a secretary, I severely underestimated how much time it was going to take on my part to be in the organization. But at the same time, as long as you are upfront with your group of um, leadership, you know, and just tell them, hey, these things are currently going on for me and I can't take on as much as I can right now. I feel like everybody's pretty understanding of a busy workload. Um, but again, I would not put off working on networking until you are done with your dissertation because that is time that you could definitely be getting done now. Excellent. Thank you. Now, I have another question um, from Blanca to Din uh, Dina. How do you make sure that your application is not overlooked when you apply online? That's a great question. <laughs> um, first of all, you always want to tailor your materials to the specific opportunity that you're targeting. Uh, so your skills and qualifications, they need to match what the job is requiring or what the position is requiring. So the closer the match, the more opportunities there are for you to advance in the screening process. So you want to think of your resume not so much as getting you the job because the interview really gets you the job. You want to think about your resume as part of a screening process, whether it screens you in or screens you out. So you really want to use the tools from the Career Services Center, for instance. Today we talked about a skills match table, how to match your skills, uh, writing down what the employer's needs are, or a client's needs if you're a consultant, uh, and then what your qualifications are. And really formulating strong accomplishment statements on your resume or CV. So not only telling that you have great communication skills, for instance, as Katie mentioned earlier, but really showing through specific examples. and being specific, showing how you can add value, infusing your document with specific specialized skills that are most relevant to your target audience will help set you apart. Excellent. Thank you, Dina. Um, and our final question is uh, twofold, and it's going to be for Megan. Uh, Debbie and Olaniki and a few other students had some questions regarding how to find um, opportunities to participate in research. Um, but first, they also wanted to know, what is the name of your local research group that you had mentioned? Um, so the name of the local research group that I am on the board for is called HARP. It's H-A-R-P, and it stands for the Heartland Association for Research Professionals. Um, but also within Kansas City, there is an ACRP and a SOFRA chapter. Those are very big um, research groups and um, throughout the whole nation. And they have huge conferences. Um, there's one for SOFRA in San Antonio in a couple of weeks. And then there's one next May in Seattle um, where you can network with people from all over the country. Um, but yeah, they are, they're very great. Um, they do cost a little bit to get involved in. HARP is not as expensive. It's more of just paying to go for the one day and getting your CEUs for the conference. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you, and I want to thank both our excellent uh, guest speakers who did such a good job. Um, now, and I also want to thank the audience for asking such great questions. So as we've learned today, a doctoral degree can take you in many career directions. However, doctoral career pathways often intersect. 
Your career exploration is an ongoing process and you should start preparing for your future today. A great way to do this is to communicate with faculty, mentors, and other professionals key to your success. So say yes to opportunities that will help you to gain experience and skills. And remember, as others lift you up, lift others up and share your experience and success. Now we'd like to share some references with you. On this slide, we've included several books that can help you further explore career pathways and navigate your career. As a reminder, please take advantage of our extensive resources, which can be found on the Career Services website. Stay connected with us. Please join us on Walden. Please join Walden Career Services on LinkedIn. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and read the success stories on our blog. Now, after today's presentation, those who have attended the full conference will receive a certificate of completion. As well, we will be emailing you a copy of the Doctoral Career Pathways Resource Guide. And with that, I want to thank you sincerely for being such an amazing audience. And we wish you the very best as you explore your career pathways. We really look forward to supporting you.